without further ado, um, we got Sean Van Dyke here. He's a construction business coach, author of a couple of really great books, um, Profit First for Contractors, which I actually read just a couple months ago and really loved it. Got a lot of great information. And myself, Alex Dunn, I uh, work on the marketing and content team here, work with a lot of our customers around our various products and our content offerings. And um, love to do these great webinars with thought leaders out there and, and hear what they have to say. Um, and then this is just a quick look at what we're going to be going through today. We're going to do a little quick introduction um, for Sean so we can talk a little bit about where he comes from. Uh, we'll look at the, the three rules for profitability at a glance. We'll deep dive onto these rules. We'll talk about the one thing you can do to, to really like start implementing some of these ideas. And then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, sounds good, Sean. You ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. Sounds awesome. Awesome. So before I let you take the floor, I'll do a quick introduction on Level Set and what we do here. Uh, we have a, a motto here, payment help is here. We are, everything we do at Level Set is designed to help people manage construction payments all the way from a contract to the final payment or collecting your retainage or retention. Um, and we do that in a number of ways. We have lien rights management software that helps you track your deadlines and send your paperwork around. Uh, we have tons and tons of data on the payment practices of customers on payment profiles. We have an attorney community that allows you to ask legal questions and get uh, advice from lawyers. Um, and we have several thousand blog posts and resource pages and ebooks and stuff to just help you become better at your job and managing the complexities of construction payment. Um, so that's enough about us. Sean, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and, and your story. Yeah. So uh, again, thanks for having me on here. And just to let everybody know, I am a former engineer. So I am a nerd for systems. And I also like to make fun of engineers. So for you construction business owners that have had to deal with engineers, maybe there's a couple of them on the call. Um, <laughs> I poke fun at engineers because I used to be one. Uh, started uh, way back when I got a couple of degrees in engineering and civil and structural engineering. Uh, did that for several years and then found my myself behind a desk, uh, looking at plans, doing the engineering stuff. And I realized, man, I don't, I don't really know how to build anything. I think I want to go learn how to build something. So I uh, got a job as a project manager on, for a commercial contractor, did that for a few years, wound my way uh, into working for a real estate, real estate developer. And uh, that was great. But then I was on the road traveling all over the nation, building commercial projects. And my wife was like, uh, you know, we had two kids at the time and she was like, you know, I'm glad you enjoy your job, but it'd be nice to have you around a little bit more. So that's when I started my first business was a real estate uh, development and construction management company. Then that led to a construction company. And then I became a uh, chief operating officer for a high-end trim and millwork company. And uh, then after that, this was been about five years ago now, I left that, uh, that job as a COO and started doing uh, the coaching and consulting thing that I'm doing now. And last year, we launched the, uh, the Built to Build Academy, which is our online and uh, coaching programs for construction business owners. So that's what I do now uh, is I get to work with contractors all over the world and help them streamline their businesses and make more money. And, uh, and then the when I'm not when I'm not doing that, I'm writing books. So I uh, got another one in the works. Hopefully, going to get it out later this year. That is, uh, it's pretty impressive, Sean. You, it sounds basically like you have dabbled in every part of the construction process to some extent, um, either tangentially or directly um, in your in your career. So that's yeah, really cool. I used to think like I'm one one of these many years ago. I was uh, it, when I was changing jobs, uh, was showing my resume to my wife, and I was like, "Hey, what do you think?" And I had all this experience listed down there, and all these different jobs in the in and around the construction in, uh, industry and engineering and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, "Hey, what do, you know? What do you think? It looks pretty good." And she just looked at. It, she goes, "To me, it looks like you can't hold down a job." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh." All right, that's one way to look at it. But then I realized, you know, part of what that mindset was is, uh, and it's still weird for me to say it, but now after starting uh, a few businesses and getting them off the ground, I'm like, oh, this is what an entrepreneur is. That's what they do. They they start businesses and uh, streamline them and get systems in place. And so that's why it, I think this is the first bio where it's ever been listed where I've, which is totally truthful. It says systems nerd right there. There could not be a more perfect description of me right there. Forget all the other stuff. It could just say Sean Van Dyke, systems nerd. That's it. Awesome. Well, we love systems and um, we're excited to hear about uh, this kind of high level system we're going to talk about today, which are the three rules for profit. So 
Uh, Sean, tell me a little bit about what we're looking at here on the, on the slide with the craftsman cycle. Yeah, so this uh, this concept, this idea, uh, this thing, actually, this thing that exists, the, the craftsman cycle, this comes straight out of my book, Profit First for Contractors. And this is really where I developed this and wrote this into the book because this, is, this speaks to so many uh, contractors. I know it was what I went through when I had my construction companies. And what, what happens is, and it's all around the numbers part and all the, the financial stuff. And for most construction business owners, they never start a construction business because they say, I want to do a bunch of paperwork. <laughs> they do it because <laughs> they're really good at building or they really like uh, the process of building something for, for other people and they get a lot of satisfaction out of that. But without the paperwork, without the number crunching, without some of the business stuff in the back end, what happens is they go out and they start pricing work. And because they don't know their numbers and most people that have you know, the guts enough to go out and start their own business, they produce really, really high quality work and they're passionate about it. But when they're guessing at their numbers and they're pricing the work, then what it means is they're probably not priced high enough. So they do really high quality work, but they just don't know what to charge for it. So what happens after that? So that's the first step in the craftsman cycles. Business owner starts pricing work and it's and it's not priced high enough to make a profit. Your customers know that. And so what happens is you get a bunch of work and that feels great. You were like, man, I'm in business and I'm getting all this work and word of mouth and this thing that I decided to do is, is, is working. We get really excited. So we go get a bunch of work and then eventually you have to go produce that work. That's where the money starts flowing out. Like the money starts coming in when you get the work and that's exciting. Now we got to go produce the work. We got to buy materials and, and, and hire people and labor. And then the money starts flying out and we realize, holy crap, where's all this money going? And we start checking the bank account. We, we don't know our numbers. We don't understand the financial side of it. We check the bank account. We say, crap, I don't have any money. So what do I got to do? Then I go to the fourth part of the cycle. I got to just go find more work. Now we know that we didn't price it right the first time, or we maybe we don't know that. And so we kind of act out of desperation. And so when we go find more work, what do we do again? Then we go price it. And then the cycle repeats. And it's this, it's this cycle of price work, get work, produce work, find work, price work, get work, produce work, find work. And it's a trap. And most construction business owners get trapped in that because you see right there at the center of that is you, the business owner the craftsman. And you never, be, because you're, you're lost with, uh, you, or you lose time and you don't understand the numbers part of it, then everything revolves around you. You are the center of your business instead of systems being the center of your business. And mm. the only way to break this cycle, as we talk about in the book, is to become profitable. And what that means, there's a lot of different, we're going to dive deeper into some of this stuff, but a lot of what that means at the high level is saying no to the wrong clients, uh, like those those type of clients that don't pay on time, that uh, that delay payments, that don't full, you know, they're always arguing. You got to say no to those and say yes to the right ones. And that's a hard thing for contractors because they're used to the cycle of like getting the work and staying in this cycle. Uh, so that's what that's what we want to do with Profit First for Contractors is give you a systematic way to look at the numbers, your financial reports and the operations of your business so that you can break this cycle. You can get out of it and so that you can work on your business instead of 100, 120% of your time working in the business. Now, people say 120%. Yeah, I mean, like nights, weekends, mornings, all of that. Um, yeah. And so the craft is real and it's brutal. Yeah, definitely. I, w I wonder uh, if anyone anyone watching here is ever felt like they've been in the craftsman cycle, or they feel like you're in it right now. Let us know in the chat, and also, um, you know, tell us how how you got out of it, or, or or let us know. Like, tell us a little story in the chat. We'd love to hear it. Um, but yeah, so let's dive in a little deeper here. We have three big profit rules that that Sean and I are going to weigh in on. I'm going to let Sean really run the show here and talk through his thoughts on how we think about income and how that's 100% of your budget, how you want to think about percentages um, and how you can kind of start small and really, you know, just just start implementing some of these systems to help you grow. And uh, and then I'll give my little, you know, two cents from from the level set perspective um, on how it goes. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that what you're seeing here, we call these are the three rules of the private first for contractor system. And the three rules are part of an overall framework that we teach contractors. And this is the great thing about the profit first for contractor system is in order in order to start, 
you don't have to do any number crunching. Your numbers don't have to be in, in order. Now, eventually to grow and to be profitable and sustainable long-term, you got to face your finances. You have to understand that. But that's where a lot of contractors get stuck is they, they'll they hear these rules, they understand the concepts, and they'll get really excited about the system. And they'll say, okay, I'm going to implement the system when I go get everything perfected. And that's the wrong approach. And that's why we want to show you these through three rules today. You don't have to have your finances in order. Your books don't even have to be set up. Now, eventually you, you need to do that. Don't get me wrong. But in order to start, starting is way more important than perfection. And so with these three rules, we're going to start with rule number one. And that is your income is 100% of your budget. Now, I know it sounds it sounds simple to say, but, but like, that's it. If you spend more then 100% of the money that comes into your business, you're going to have problems. You're going to go into debt uh, or you're going to have to find some other way to get that money. And there's a lot of things that will keep you from staying under your 100%. Again, not knowing your numbers correctly, um, estimating things wrong, meaning like, hey, we have, a, I don't know, whatever, a $50,000 job that we've priced that's based on, I don't know, let's say a thousand man hours or whatever, right? And so we expect $50,000 to come in based on our thousand man hours. And then it takes us 1200 man hours. That's spending more than 100% of your budget. So when you realize this and you're, and you're looking at, a, at your numbers at a percentage base, we just start there and say, hey, if we're a million dollar company, we need to understand. And that's what our budget is based on. If we spend 1.1 million, we got problems. So that's where we start is your income is 100% of your budget. And then in the profit first for contractor system, we break that the way that you look at that money coming in into different bank accounts. We're not going to get into all the details of that, but the, the way that you look at your bank accounts and the percentage that you set up for those bank accounts, they always equal 100%. And so as you, as you grow, the dollars, dollar amounts may change. We'll get into that in a minute. The dollar amounts may change, but the percentage always has to equal 100%. Yeah, absolutely. And and even though that seems like so fundamental and simple, it actually becomes really complicated because of, um, you know, taking on multiple jobs, not understanding exactly where your costs come from. And not even, you know, a lot of times I think in your book, you mentioned like you, you don't even account for costs because, you know, as the business owner, you're just doing them yourselves and you're not thinking about like how that, how, um, you know, you're not really paying yourself to do the things that are creating costs or it's more like opportunity costs of not being able to be in the, the field doing the work. Um, but the math doesn't lie. And when you start looking at um, your income being 100% of your budget and, and really holding yourself to that accountability, it, it kind of can be a slap in the face. Yeah. And, and what we discussed in the book here is, is understanding, and this is why the, the profit first for contractors system is so simple. And, and let me clarify this, the, the system is not accounting. See, you have to understand that there's accounting, what your accountant does. And what, so for example, like many people I'm sure on this call have had this conversation with their accountant, or they've kind of had this moment where they look down at the bottom of the profit and loss statement and they see a positive number there. Let's, I don't know. Let's say it's, let's say it's $80,000. And so on, on paper, based on the accounting principles, there's $80,000 there. It says you're profitable. And then you go to your bank account. And you look there, that number's never the same. And they're like, well, wait a minute. I don't understand if this profit and loss statement, this thing I don't really understand says that I'm profitable. But I look at my bank account. I got like five grand in the bank account. Where's the, where's the money? And that is the key to understanding your profit and loss statement is an accounting financial report. It has its purpose, but not all of the money that comes into your business or flows out of your business is shown there. Well, I should say, 100% of the money that comes into your business, that's your top line. That's right up there at the top of your profit and loss statement. But you get that, let's say that $80,000 number at the bottom, that's called net profit. What that doesn't account for are things like your taxes and owner's draws. A lot of con uh, construction business owners are paying themselves through owner's draw. Now, again, we break that down in the book, nothing necessarily wrong with that, but you have to understand, well, wait a minute, there's $80,000. This is a really high level example. There's $80,000 at the bottom of the profit and loss statement and it doesn't account owner's draws, but the owner pulls $100,000 out during that year or whatever, you're negative $20,000. That, that's breaking rule number one. And you say, well, wait a minute. My accountant said that I was profitable, not only, and I'm going to pay some taxes on that profit, and 
they're going to send me a bill for telling me that I'm profitable, but yet I'm breaking rule number one because I pulled out more than than was shown on there. And it, and the accounting part is confusing. That's why private first for contractors, very simple. We say, you got to understand 100% of your, uh, your income is 100% of your budget. That's it. So all the money that comes in, Again, it does matter what's on the profit and loss statement. You got to follow the rules. That's how the IRS looks at it. That's how you got to file it. But you have to understand that profit and loss can be uh, can be confusing, and it can and it's open to interpretation. But the one thing that is not open to interpretation is your bank account. You can be confused by your profit and loss statement. Your profit and loss statement can be wrong. There could be some things that are not shown on there that maybe should because they're missed. Your bank account that tells the real story. That's the money that you got. And everybody on this call, I can, I can guarantee this, promise this. When, when cash gets tight and they got to make payroll next week, they don't call their accountant to run a profit and loss statement to figure out if they got money. They go log into their bank account and they say, I can't make payroll or I can make payroll, but there ain't that much there. Right. That's, that's the key is like that, that bank account. And the way we say we set it up is we set up different bank accounts for different aspects of your business. But that all comes back to this rule number one. If you spend more than 100% of the money that comes into your business, you're going to have problems. Absolutely. And, and in addition to checking that bank account, you might be checking your accounts receivable and saying, who, you know, where is this money? And, and that kind of brings me to the other side of this coin, which is, yes, your income is 100% of your budget, um, but only if you get paid. Um, and, and it sucks, but it's the truth. Like a lot of times people don't get paid or they get slow paid. Um, we run a lot of surveys here at Level Set and, you know, we see how slow payment can be. And we see that only three out of every five contractors are paid in full and on time in every job. Um, and that can really, that can be detrimental. Um, there's things like back charges and deductions and withholdings and, and payment delays, just the time value of money by itself, like can eat into that hundred percent that you think you have. That's right. Um, and you gotta be very careful to manage uh, that paperwork and those things like back charges, making sure you get your change orders and your pay applications in on time, that kind of like messy paperwork side of things. When you do that, it helps you get paid faster. It helps you get paid in full. Um, and again, like like you said, Sean, you know, nobody decided to get into construction because they wanted to do a bunch of paperwork and accounting and, and like math. They did it because they want to build. And and this stuff sometimes seems um, frustrating to do, um, but it's important because you want to work with 100% of what what you on the contract you signed. If you sign a contract for $100,000, you want to get that $100,000. And if you don't, it eats into that 100%, and it can you know it can be detrimental. Yeah, no, that that's exactly right. That's a, that's a great point to make too. Is again, let's go to example. Let's say that your budget is based on a million dollars worth of work. What are we really talking about here? We're talking about a million dollars of work produced, invoiced, and collected. Like it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It almost doesn't matter how much work you produce if you don't invoice it and you don't collect it. It's never going to show up in the bank account. Now, again, th this is where the accountants start confusing things and saying, well, if you've invoiced it, then it's work in progress and there's some way to, to account for it. And I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. You should if you if you have produced a million dollars worth of work and you've got you've only received 750,000 of that by the end of the year. Sure, the accountant can manipulate the accounting to save you on some taxes, but that ain't, that ain't gonna make payroll when that, that money's gotta hit that bank account. And so that that gets into that 100% if, cause we're looking at, like you said, the, the, the time value of money, right? If our budget's based on a million dollars, but it takes us 14 you know, in a year, but it takes us 14 months to get that million dollars, guess what? Your budget's not a million dollars. It's exactly. something less than that. And your business keeps operating. You've got those overhead expenses. And so what I tell companies is, hey, if you've, if you've got to put a system in place to get that money so that you can maintain positive cash flow. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. One is like, once you get customers and get a better contract that ensures that you keep your cash flow. The other things that we have to put in place for things like what Level Set provides is some, some avenues to make sure pennies on the dollar to make sure you're getting that money in so you can stay as close to the 100% that you've budgeted for. And when you, and I always say like having these expenses, 
like a level set, like a lawyer, like a CPA. It, a lot of contractors look at these expenses as overhead. And I was, again, overhead's an accounting term. I get why we use it, but like, I like to say like, forget all of that. Every dollar that you spend in your business should make you money. So for example, every contractor, every construction business owner on this call right now, well, they're, if they're here, they've got a laptop computer. They probably have a cell phone. The reason that they have a cell phone is because the cell phone makes them money because it's much cheaper to pay a cell phone bill every month than it is to write out a, a letter and put a stamp on an envelope and send it out right? So your cell phone is an overhead expense. You don't sell cell phones, but you're using the cell phone to make money. So it's the same thing. Anything on the expense side, I don't look at it as a cost. I'm saying, if I spend this much money, how does it drive revenue or how does it give me my time back so that mm. I can stay as close to that 100% receiving that income as quickly as possible so I can maintain cash flow? Absolutely. Uh, let's get into rule number two on that note, because I think it leads in pretty well. We got to talk about uh, playing the percentages. Yeah. So, so playing the percentages, here's, here's what I mean. So uh, I'm going to try not to do a lot of math on, on, uh, on this call here, because I know people will kind of check out, but just follow me, you know, for example, on this, and I'm just doing it, you know, off the top of my head. Like I said, I'm a former engineer. So I depend on a calculator to actually do math. I can't do it that much in my head, but let's say that you take 10% of $100,000, right? 10% of $100,000 is $10,000. Okay. As your business grows, for example, then let's say that you, and we're talking net profit, your net profit is $100,000. And that is 10% of your total revenue. As your business grows, then you receive $200,000 in net profit. But now because of the size of your business or whatever, that's only 8%. So that's where I say you've got to play the percentages and not get freaked out too much. Meaning like at a, as a, at a smaller company, it might be easier to make a higher percentage, but that, that percentage, 10% of let's say a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. As you grow to a $2 million company, then 8% of $2 million is like $160,000 more dollars, but a lower percentage. So you have to understand and you have to play the percentages in order to predict the profitable growth of your business. And this gets back, ties back to rule number one, 100%. So you break those down into your percentages that you need for your business. So we want to set aside a, uh, a percentage for net profit. We want to set aside a percentage for our taxes. We want to set aside a percentage. And this is a percentage of every dollar that comes in to pay the owner's salary. And then we need obviously our operating expenses and other things. All of those percentages are going to change as our business grows. But just because the percentage may be lower, a percent, I'll say it like this, a lower percentage of a much bigger number is more dollars than a bigger percentage of a smaller number. Now, some people are like, what? But, but think yeah, about, so think about what, that. What you're trying to say to some extent is like, you could make, uh, your business could make a million dollars this year and, and your profit is, you know, some amount of that. You can go and double that. You can, your, your business can double the amount of revenue it makes and make the same amount of profit as it did. And you're just working twice as hard, doing twice as many jobs, making twice as much revenue, but it just isn't converting to the profit in the same, yeah. at the same scale. Yeah. I would say, I would say, would you rather have a $500,000 company making a 10% net profit or a million dollar company making a 5% net profit? Yeah. I'd take the it, former. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. The cash is the same, but like you said, double the amount of work, you know, people say, Oh, it's twice the amount of headache. No, no, no. It's exponential from there. Like I would say it's quadruple the amount of stress and headaches to, to, and that's, but most people are so focused on growth, right? We got to grow. We got to grow. We got to grow. But I'm like growing the bottom line is all that matters. And when you understand how the percentages work, then mm -hmm. you can actually get through the percentages to understand what's underlying at the do the dollar figures here. The, the other, the other way that the, um, that the playing the percentage comes into it, it, can, it ties into margin versus markup, for example. So a couple, a couple of things there. So if you were to take a look 
at your profit and loss statement, you've got a category called cost of goods sold. And I see this all the time when I'm working with construction business owners is we'll take a look at their profit and loss statement, do some analysis and we'll say, oh, your, your cost of goods sold is, for example, 75%. And what does that mean? That percentage, well, 75% of every dollar that comes in is spent on your labor materials, subcontractors and equipment. And I say, okay, 75% is too high. We need to get it down into 70 or 68 or, you know, whatever it is. We need to reduce your cost of goods sold. So what can you do? And so I'll ask a, a contractor, hey, how can we lower costs? And the first thing the thing is, well, I could cut back on my quality of materials uh, I could, and I'm like, yeah, 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 but hold on, wait a minute. You cut back on the quality uh, of things. Sure. You'll reduce the, you'll reduce the dollar spent on those things, but you won't be able to sell that as a premium service as a, you know, premium quality. Right. So they automatically go to cutting the dollars. And I'm like the easiest way to reduce your costs, 75%, get it down to 70 is to simply charge more Increase for what, your price. what you're charging now. All and right. that's how you got to play the, per, that's how you got to play the percentages. And most contractors that I work with, when we run the numbers, the, 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 the percentages change and they're about 20% too low. They're charging 20% too low. And they say, well, Sean, I can never charge that. No one around here, you know, charges that. And I'm like, Hey, you don't have to believe me. It's the math of your business and the math isn't going to lie. So one last thing I want to say about playing the percentages is understanding the difference between margin and markup. And if and if you struggle with that, then you can grab the book and we go into deep detail. But I, I'm going to say a statement right here. And if you don't understand what this statement means, then you've got to dig into this concept right here of markup versus margin. So uh, if you mark up something by 20%, it does not produce a 20% margin. A 20% markup yields a 16.7% margin. Now, if you don't understand that, drop a note in the chat or whatever. And trust me, you're not alone. It, most contractors get that wrong. A 25% markup produces a 20% margin. So a lot of people get that wrong. Again, we don't have time to get into all the details of that, but that's one of those percentages that you have to understand how it works in your business. And when you can make that change, that simple mathematical change, and you have confidence in your numbers and your percentages, it's much easier to stand in front of a customer that says, oh, well, your price is too high. I'm like, no, it's not because we're not, we're not going out of business to work for you. We understand what our numbers, what our numbers are. Yeah, absolutely. And just for all the listeners out there, like if that is confusing you, I wish we could dive deep into this stuff as much as we want to on this call. But Sean's book breaks it down in a way that literally anyone can understand. It's really great. Um, and I'm going to kind of pass over this other point really quickly to, to keep things moving along here. Um, but I will say that the complexities and the way the relationships between these percentages also get stressed by the nature of the construction industry. Um, we showed it on a slide earlier on. You have this crazy, you know, mess of arrows where, you know, that kind of explains how payment needs to flow and how documentation flows and kind of it, it gets at this root cause of the, the mess that is construction payments and how understanding how cash flow works, understanding that you know people will wait to pay you until they are paid can put even more stresses on these percentages and on your ability to keep your business running smoothly and like sean said like you don't want to work with someone um you don't want to go out of business just to work with someone you want to you want to find those right prices you want to be understanding of the time it can take to get paid and the kind of uh shell games that happen um in construction payment so we'll just yeah, quickly yeah, the other thing I'll say about this robbing Peter to pay Paul. Sometimes, I mean, that's what the the business owner does when they're in, when they're caught in that cycle. They go find more work because they realize I got to go. And so, any money that they're using, they go find more work because they need that next deposit. They need that deposit to end up paying for the previous the uh, the previous job. But the other thing about getting payments from your uh, from your vendors, or if you're a subcontractor working for general contractors, sometimes it's not intentional, but whatever your payment terms are, you have to understand it's just human nature that when we have a timeline associated with it, that's usually when people start. 
So if you've got a pay period that's 30 days out, 45 days out, I'm not going to say that your, your contractors that you're working for are intentional about it. Some of you would probably argue, oh yeah, they're very intentional. They always pay us late. But like, think about that. If they always pay you late, then you got to you got to start reminding them beforehand and there are laws and things that you got to follow like lien rights and notifications and sometimes just putting them on notice that you're going to do the thing that's in your contract brings it to front of mind they're like oh i got to pay this person but we just think like oh they know they owe me money it's been 30 days mm-hmm. at 30 days is when they start thinking about it and it takes and you know how long it takes for you to get your paperwork together and so it takes them time and so it's like wow why do they always pay 2 weeks 3 weeks late it's because you didn't start 2 weeks ahead of the time reminding them that this thing was due and that's one of the simplest things that you can one of the simplest systems that you can get in place is to say hey we we're issuing, we're, we're doing the work, we're issuing the invoices and we're waiting on payment. And then that's where the, that's where the breakdown comes in. There's still a system between issuing the invoice and collecting the payment. I'm going to be very active during that time. And it doesn't have to be conf- confrontational. It actually could be very customer friendly to say, Hey, here's your invoice. And a couple of days go by just checking in, by the way, here's some notices that are coming out or whatever that needs to be. And then you stay, you know, it's the squeaky wheel, man. Uh, and you can, yeah. you, can, you can get that cash flow in when you need it. That's that's definitely true. And and even like squeaky wheel seems a little like, it's like a little aggressive to some extent because like it, we like to think of it here at Level Set more as like communication and collaboration. Whereas a lot of people are out on the job, they're working with each other, they see each other. The people that are exchanging the invoices and the pay apps don't all the time. And one of the best things you can do, and, and we've seen customers say, oh, we don't want to send these notices. Like oh, we've been working with them for a long time. Uh, we don't know. And then they start doing it and their customers are like, oh, this is great. Like, this, perfect. Yeah, Thanks. they love it. I know exactly where to send the check. I know exactly how much it's for. I have all the information I need. It's this idea of creating visibility, creating uh, this open line of communication to deal with stuff that typically is kind of behind closed doors. Yeah. Mo- most people think that it's like it's going to be confrontational, but it's actually the opposite because you're helping the other business run a better business by exactly. notifying them and reminding them. And it, like, like you said, it, it, gives this sense of collaboration. Like, man, I don't have to worry about, you know, Smith builders or whatever, because they always keep me up, up you know, up to date exactly where I am. It's not confrontational. It's collaborative, but just like exactly. Said. Cool. So let's rock into point number three or rule number three, not a point. There's a rule. You got to follow yeah, it. Everybody got to remember to follow the rules. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. Now this is, this is the part that I said, okay, we're going to, I'm going to make everybody here permanently profitable and some people are rolling their eyes. I can guarantee if you do this one simple step, not only is this going to make you permanently profitable, this is also the key to starting this cash management system. And remember what I said before, profit first for contractors is not accounting. It is cash management. This cash management, this profit first system sits on top of your accounting and it's a filter at which you view your money. So think about it like that. But here's here's the key. You want to start small at 1%. So what you want to do is set aside, go and do this today, go to your bank or log into your bank and create a profit account. And I don't care what the balance is in your bank account right now. I want you to move 1% over to your profit account. Whether it's a, you know, if it's a thousand dollars, you're going to move $10 over. You can operate your business on the $990 that's left. I don't, if it's a hundred thousand dollars, you're going to go move $1,000 into this profit account and don't touch it. That's the, that's the system. And then going forward, every check that you get, every time you get a deposit, you, someone pays an invoice, you're going to take 1% and go transfer it and move it into that profit account and don't touch it. And it will be there at the end of the quarter and at the end of the year. And for some of you that are on this call, that's probably going to be the first time you've ever been profitable. And here's the magic about 1%. It's so small, you're not going to miss it. I promise you. If you don't do it, you're just going to end up spending it. Um, But when you do this and you create this habit with your cash, with your money, then after a few months, you're going to bump it up to 2%. Again, get used to this habit of 1% and then go to 2% and then continue that habit and then bump it up to 3%. And you'll see these small little changes over time will start to add up. And then for the first time, it doesn't matter what your accountant says. It doesn't matter how confusing your profit and loss statement is. If you spent 
six or seven months pulling out 3%, 1% at a time and gradually build that up, you're going to end up with some kind of money in that account. And you'll say, I know exactly how much profit I have because I have it designated for that. And here's the key. Now, if any of you have ever struggled to pay your taxes, just do the same thing with your tax account. You can go, because when you make a profit, then you will have to pay taxes. It's inevitable, right? So you can do the same thing with your tax account. Is 1% going to be enough to pay your taxes this year? No, probably not. But it's going to be something more than you than you already have. And then you bump it up to two and three and four. And eventually, here's what happens. You end up with four, five, 6%. And we're talking about total revenue that comes in. Five, six, 7% of every dollar that comes in. Then you have a conversation with your CPA and they're going to say, hey, Justin, hey, Alex, this is when this is how much money you owe this quarter, $10,000 or whatever. And and they're going to say that was based on a 35 percent tax bracket based on your adjusted gross, blah, blah, all of this kind of accounting crap. And you're going to go like $10,000. Cool. Yep. I look at my bank account. I got $11,000 in the bank account. Um, good. And he's like, well, well, wait a minute. How'd you do that? Well, I set I set aside 5% of every check that comes in. Be like, well, that's not, and your accountant will say something stupid like this. That's not how you calculate your taxes. And you're like, oh yeah, man. That's why I'm paying you to calculate my taxes. I'm just setting money aside to run my business. And it's very simple. And that right there is going to reduce this. It takes the mystery out of paying your taxes. So we start small with 1%. And you can, we say, do that in the profit account, then do it again in a tax account. Start that again for your owner's compensation, the money that you're pulling out of your business to pay yourself. And it's just a repeatable system and it's not complicated. Now, yeah. some people are going to hear this and they're going to get really, really excited. And like, we've already got a question that we're going to jump, we'll get to at the Q and A of like, well, what should my percentage be? That's, I love that question, right? What, what should my percentage be? And people hear the system and then I'll say, hey, go stick this percentage. You know, it should be this percentage. They will run out to their bank today and try to transfer 10%, 12%, whatever it is. But if you've never made 10 or 12% profit, the money's not going to be there. That's why we yeah. say start with 1%. 10%, hey, that's that may be the goal. Get there one month, one quarter, one chunk of period at a time, establishing a good habit. And you'll you'll realize that you'll get there much faster and you won't end up spending that money. Yeah, definitely. It's like the classic, you know, financial advice that everyone gives you. It's not it's not about what you make, it's about what you keep. That's and right. if you don't take a little bit, just that little bit, 1%, it's like so little, you, like you said, Sean, you're not gonna miss it. Um, just putting it on the side, just throw throw the little safety rope down into the craftsman cycle to so that you can start pulling yourself out a little bit by a little bit a few people chatted in saying they're feeling like they're in the craftsman cycle right now yeah i'm sure other people have you know pulled themselves out and probably you know this resonates with them just just peeling off that little bit that one percent is uh it's a great way to start um one quick thing that we always you know promote at level set um around getting paid and, and staying profitable is and getting paid faster is the idea of just this one document you can send. It's it's so simple. Yep. Um, it's called a preliminary notice. Uh, uh, you might know it by another name. If you're in Florida, it's a you know 20 day notice or California, it's a 20 day notice. Some people call them pre liens, which we don't like because it kind of sounds scary and related to liens. Um, but it's it's a great document. It, it just lets people know you're on the job. If you're you know if you look at this little graphic we have up here, I don't know if my mouse is visible, um, but if you're a sub subcontractor or a supplier or even a sub, you're you're rem further removed from the people with the money. And sending that preliminary notice lets them know you're there, lets them know that you need to be paid. And it, like you said earlier, Sean, it helps them run their business better. They know that they have to make this payment. Um, we've seen it in states where it's not even a required document. It's not even part of the lien law statutes um, to just send this document and it moves your invoice to the top of the pile. It gets you paid. You know, If you're waiting 60 days to get paid, you're going to start getting paid in 50 or 40 or 30 or, you know, it just continues to go down. You lower that DSO when you get paid faster, you have less of those question marks. When you look at your PL statement, you have less of those question marks when you're, you're sitting there at the end of the month, wondering if you can pay your guys and gals on your team. And, uh, it just kind of like that, that, uh, a little bit of faster payment gets rid of a lot of stress. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and like you said, those preliminary notices, <laughs> like you said, the preliminary lien or whatever, like that sounds, the, the terminology sounds bad. Same thing in, in, uh, when we start talking financial stuff, it's like, oh man, this accounting stuff, it sounds bad. Profit and loss statement, balance sheet, owner's draws and all that. And you just simplify and just say, Hey, th- it's just a system. It's just a system of communication. So we're going to send this thing out and it just it brings it, it just makes you stand out as a professional. When you stand out as a professional, you're doing something uh, something different. Different is better. Uh, then there's more value there when your uh, your contractors or your other people on your team that you work with come back to you because they know you got your ducks in a row, man. Like they're this company is not going to let us fall through the cracks, and we won't have this battle at the end. Yeah. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a great way. Like, again, you th- to protect, like what we're saying here, the protect uh, healthy cash flow is first of all, understand where the money is going. And then anything, any barriers that are going to stand in that way of that cash flow, I got to go put a system or something on that to keep that. I mean, sometimes barriers pop up. Like we all saw this past year when material price increase and all of that, all of that kind of stuff. There was a lot of chaos around it. Sometimes some things are just out of our control, but everything else, I'm going to focus on what I can control and make sure that those barriers are always reduced. Awesome. I love that. Way to way to end it with fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to open up to questions here. We got a few questions in the chat already, which I love. So throw some more questions in there. Anyone who has any questions for Sean or myself, um, l- let us have it. And uh, before we answer any of them, I just want to give Sean one more chance to talk a little bit about how you can learn more um, from him and from the resources that he's created. Yeah. So you can go, uh, you can search on Google or whatever for profit first for contractors. It's available on Amazon. We've got a Kindle version. Uh, we got the uh, audible version and it's also on iTunes as well. So you can grab it in any of those places. You can go to profitfirstcontractor.com and get some additional resources, all of the table tables and the figures from the books. Cause you, like I said, you will eventually need to crunch some numbers and we're going to help walk you through uh, how to just get started. It, like with nothing else, start with the 1%. But some people are going to be fired up about this and they want to know like, what's the next, you know, what's the next step? I get the 1%. I want to know how to get to the, the next level. All of that is at profitfirstcontractor.com. And if you want to learn some details about how to set up the bank accounts, like we were like we were talking about, I've got a free video training series at fourcoreprinciples.com. Now we put the number four here, but if you forget that and you type in four core principles, it'll still take you to the same place. So go to fourcoreprinciples.com, sign up for a free video training series, and I'm going to send you an email. Uh, I'm going to send you a video every day for the next five or six days and walk you through the bank account step by step. Uh, and then you can also go check out, as we mentioned before, our um, our business training academy for construction business owners and managers. That's at uh, go to builttobuildacademy.com, and uh, you can see all the information about our different programs sign up to join our wait list and we're going to send you again i'm always about providing value first so go to built to build academy.com sign up for our wait list we're going to give you some more free resources give you kind of a uh, show you what's in the academy and what to expect we're going to give you a free training uh, course on time management and some some other things to follow up on some sales trainings and some other things and then when it's time to enroll jump into the academy and we'd love to have you there um, and with that you know if you want me to want me to knock out Greg's question, I certainly can. Yeah, that would be great. And I will just add to, uh, you know, Sean's, uh, you know, recommendations of where to go next. If you couldn't tell from this uh, awesome webinar, Sean has a great reading voice. He actually reads the audible. I highly <laughs> recommend, you know, you're cruising, cruising around to job site to job site, get the audible version. You can, you know, bust through the book in just a week or two of driving around and, uh, you know, doing dishes or whatever you're doing at, at night. Um, but yeah, definitely check it out. So it's enjoyable to listen to as well. So yeah, if you don't mind a little bit of a Southern twang, but I think it really, I think it adds to it, to be honest. I'll just... <laughs> yeah. All right. So let me, uh, Greg popped a question in here. Thanks for uh, asking the question, Greg. Uh, what is an ideal cost of goods sold percentage of revenue for a $2 million revenue business? All right. So this is what we say in the, in the book. We, a lot of construction business owners, get stuck on this thing called industry standards. And you've probably heard it before, like a contractor can't charge more than a 20% markup. And like we said before, a 20% markup yields a 16.7% margin. 
But if your expenses are 20%, guess what? You're going out of business by 3.3% every year because you believe that there's an industry standard. There are no industry standards. There is just the math of your business. But for a $2 million company, here's what I would look at. What I, what I would say, there are some rules of thumb. So for example, for a, uh, Greg, and if you want to tell me like what type of business that you're in, are you a builder, a modeler, are you a service-based contractor, whatever, that, that'll give me a little bit more information while you're popping that in there, if you're still here. Um, let me give you some of the rules of thumb. In general, if you're a a, uh, a remodeler, maybe, okay, demolition uh, and deconstruction subcontractor. Okay, so very specialized then. All right, so what I would say for general contractors, and this probably applies to some remodelers as well, but you want to be for... I'm going to say with net profit, you want it to be somewhere around eight to eight to ten percent net profit is a good rule of thumb. Now, depending on your market, your area, the size of your company, if you're a twenty million dollar company, you might be able to survive on a nine percent net profit because nine percent of twenty million dollars is a whole heck of a lot of money. That's why you got to play the percentages. But those are kind of where I look at. It. It's like, hey, are we somewhere around ten percent now? For a demolition contractor, specialty contractor, uh, I would say roofers, uh, uh, plumbers, electricians, HVAC guys, very they're very specific in what they do. Um, probably a lot of high volume business because they're service based. Maybe they still do some construction or whatever. You're typically, typically going to see anywhere between 12% to maybe even 20% uh, net profit. Now, the reason that those type of companies, service based companies can do that is because they're very efficient. They do one thing. We do plumbing. We do electrical. And the more specialized you are, the more potential you have to be uh, to be profitable. Now, that doesn't doesn't mean you shouldn't be a general contractor or remodeler. These are just some of the rules of rules of thumb. So specifically to what Greg's looking at uh, here with his business, I would say if you if your books are accurate and you have everything accounted for, I'm looking at somewhere around 70 to 70%. So 70% of every dollar that comes into your business is probably spent on your cost of goods sold. Why 70%? Because in general, then that leaves about 20% to be spent on the expenses. So we got 70% on cost of goods sold, 20% on my expenses. Remember rule number one, 100% has to add up to 100%. So 70% so on cost of goods sold, 20% uh, on my expenses. That leaves me with 10% net profit. Now, depending uh, on where you're located and all of those kind of those things kind of factored in, you might be, uh, you might be at a 68% cost of goods sold. Then that gives you some more room to spend on your expenses. Maybe maybe that requires a little bit more specialty um, services on your expenses side, which we still gonna land at 10%. Or maybe, maybe you could be as low as 60%, 20% on expenses, and you have a 20% net profit. But, but that's where I'm gonna start out with to specifically answer, where should I be on my cost of goods sold? Somewhere around 70% or lower. And then uh, Yafit had asked in the in the chat. Uh, she said, "Hi, one percent of every payment received." Yeah. Now that's that's how the one percent works. Do you like you get a check today? Move one percent. You get a check tomorrow. One percent tomorrow. No, don't do that. That's kind of madness. <laughs> well, what you can do, and this we explain this in the in the book, is we have an income account where all the money comes in and we let that money sit in that income account. And then every two weeks we drop into the income account and then do our allocations or do our disbursements into our different accounts. But when you're starting out, like go set up that a profit account and move 1% over of your bank balance today. Then next week, drop into your bank account, see how much money's come, come has come in and then go, go move 1% over uh, that that's come in. And I promise you, you're not going to miss it. Definitely. And then you get a lot of cool stuff as that starts to build up where you can use like money market accounts and stuff like that to just grow it while it sits there and then disperse it as needed. Um, a lot of cool stuff happens when you just start sliding that 1% off. Any awesome. other any, questions? Yeah, any other questions? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, when can you touch the one percent profit account? Well, here's what we here's what we recommend in the book is that you you keep doing this, and then once a quarter, you take fifty percent of the profit from the profit account and get it out of the business. That's yours as the owner for owning the business. That's your reward. Now, you as the owner, you can choose to do whatever you want to with it. But we we say, hey, 
like let that thing build up. And it's the same thing as like what if you if you've ever invested in any company in the stock market, they will pay you quarterly dividends. Your business is the same thing. So build up those profits at the end of the quarter, take 50% out. What do we do with the other 50% that we leave in there? Well, that's for your emergency. Things are going to happen. You need some cash in your business. Now you could you can set up some a bank account to deal with an emergency fund. And we have plenty of clients that that do that. They use the profit account. They pull 50% out and they say, okay, now I'm going to fund this emergency fund. And that emergency fund is going to sit there and I'm never going to do anything with it because something like, oh, I don't know, a pandemic might pop up and we might need to survive for three or four months with being shut down, right? And I have a lot of clients that luckily, fortunately, they, they were doing profit first before the pandemic hit. And that's exactly what they used it for. But we recommend dropping into your profit account once a quarter, because that's also when you're going to have to pay some taxes too. So drop into your profit account and pull it out of the business or make a decision about what you want to do with the profit. And then you're also going to have to take some money out for taxes, probably to pay your quarterly taxes. Nice. Let's see, my question is, yeah, Mike asks, how do you factor in previous debt into your job allocation? Do you take it out of new profit or do you allocate that to your overhead? Okay, so here's how we deal with here's how we deal with debt. First of all, we stop uh, uh, we stop new debt. We have to stop new debt. And the only way, the only way to get out of debt is to make a profit. So what we recommend a profit first, and it depends on how much debt that you have, is you start running a profitable business. And then what we say in the book is once a quarter, like we said, instead of taking that 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 profit out, if you're in debt, you take 99% of your profit and you put it towards your debt. And people say, well, why, Sean, why 99%? You take that other 1% and you go celebrate because you just did something really, really hard. And at first, that 1% is going to be a cup of coffee. It's not going to be much. And then a quarter from now, it's going to be, you're going to take your, you're going to take that 1% as you're working your way out of debt. And then you're going to take your family out to dinner. And then a year from now, 18 months from now, that 1% when you're out of debt, it's going to be a, a, a vacation that you've never taken before, paid in cash for the thing that you said you wanted to create freedom, which is starting this business. So what we recommend is if you're in debt, stop going further into debt, sell some things off, get really, really... Uh, adamant about getting out of debt and you just have to make more money than you spend. I know it sounds simplistic, but that's it. You will never borrow your way to prosperity. You have to stop it when you run a profitable business. When we create a profit, then we go eliminate the debt with most of it. And then when that debt is eliminated and you've, you, and I've seen this before with companies, they have hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and then they start working it. They use the profits to go pay off the debt. Then when the debt is cleaned up, They've got this habit of generating hundreds of thousands of dollars over a period of time. Guess what? With no debt, generate hundreds of thousands of dollars and every, all the other bills are paid. You're no longer going into debt. Then you've got the system become profitable. So it, it does take time, uh, but that's what that's how we deal with the debt. Yeah, awesome. Well, we are getting close to time here. I want to let you do one more, Sean. I'm going to answer yeah. this other quick question from Jesse. They asked if Little Set works with American com uh, just American companies or if they work outside, um, especially in Canada. So yes, we do have a couple customers up in uh, with our neighbors to the north, and we are able to help people outside uh, the U.S. of A. So definitely reach out to us, uh, me or uh, via our website. You can schedule a demo and you know chat with them if you'd like. But yeah, there's a, another good question here from Dylan for you, Sean. Yeah. So it sounds like Dylan, so you shouldn't pay yourself your salary from your OC account. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that means what we call the oper uh, operating. Yeah. Uh, well, Dylan, do you mean the opera? We call it the owner's comp account. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not really clear there what you, what you're intending, but what it does, let me say like this, depending on what the business entity is for your business, you may not be like if you're a sole proprietor or LLC, depending on the structure or whatever, you might not be able to pay yourself a salary, meaning on payroll. Now, if you're incorporated or something like that, then you can be on salary as an employee in the business because the business entity is paying taxes on the profits of the business. And then you as the owner take owner's draws. For LLC or sole prop, everything is an owner's draw. What, what matters, back to rule number one, is 100%. Are you paying yourself on payroll? 
to compensate for the value that you're doing, uh, the value of the work that you do in the business? And are you taking owner's draws? Owner's draws don't show up on the profit and loss statement. Uh, the, the payroll does. So you got to make sure. I, I, you need to speak with your accountant about how your business entity is set up. And then you need to take a look and say, hey, I want to pay myself $100,000. I don't care where it comes from. It could be $50,000 of salary and $50,000 of uh, uh, owner's distributions, but let's not kid ourselves. It's $100,000, right? If you, had, if you didn't work in the business and you just owned it and you wanted to still take that $50,000 owner's draw, but the value of the work that you're doing is $100,000, you're going to have to hire somebody at $100,000 to come in and do what you do. You're going to have to raise your prices or do more work. So however you pay yourself, that's really accountant, a question for your accountant, but you can understand the math. It still has to come out of that 100%. Heck yeah. The, the rules are coming back in force on our question and answer here. Um, if there are any more questions, you're welcome to throw them in there. We have three more minutes. And um, hey, if you all think of another question that didn't come up um, during today, we do have the expert center over, sorry, I guess it's the community now at levelset.com slash payment dash help. Um, you can ask any question that comes to mind. We'll get Sean in there to answer some questions. We have lawyers in there answering questions. We have credit professionals, AR professionals, um, accounting professionals. We have all sorts of people from around the construction industry specifically answering these questions. Um, so toss them in there um, and we'll definitely get to answer them uh, at a later date. But today, uh, what was that one more question that kind of just disappeared? Oh, I think that was Mike's question again about the about the debt. Okay. And, yeah, answer. just to be clear, he, he was asking, do you, um, um, do you put it in, where, where does it come out of? And I would say, hey, it comes out of the profit. Like yeah. if, you, if you try to work your debt cost into your job cost and what you charge it for, like if you and I run the same business, you've got debt, I don't, and you've, you know, that's a, that's a cost in, into your job cost or whatever, um, then you're going to be higher priced. You're going to lose out because like, you don't want to put your debt on your owners. Now, the reason you may have gone into debt is because you weren't charging enough. So you may need to raise your prices, but I'm looking at, I'm raising the prices because of the value of the work that we do. I'm not raising my prices because I got a bunch of debt. It might they, raising your price is going to solve both things, but you got to be really clear on on what it what it is, what the price is, and that's where the math comes. And the math is not going to lie. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for coming. I really got a lot out of this. Hopefully, the uh, crowd who joined us did as well. And like I said, anyone has other questions, just head over to levelset.com, click the ask a button or ask a question button at the top of the page, and and let us know if y'all have any questions. And uh, you know, Sean. As has his info up here, and uh, there'll be a version of this thing ready for you to watch if you want to watch it again tomorrow. Awesome. All right, everyone, have a good day. And uh, Sean, we will talk to you soon. All right, thanks, guys.